Hi, welcome back. In the previous segment, we described several types of metrics to measure security levels. In this segment, we are going to deepen our now understanding of these different types by looking at a few examples of the kind of metrics that you might encounter in practice. Let's revisit the different types. On the left-hand side, we have controls. This type of metrics capture what kind of protection measures you have in place. Since they only include information on what the organization itself is doing, they leave out the threat environment. As we move toward the right-hand side, the metrics increasingly include the threat environment. They, therefore, change from deterministic to stochastic variables. The metrics on the left-hand side are driven by defenders' actions, the controls they put in place and the vulnerabilities they discover. Towards the right, they are more driven by the events that occur when the controls and vulnerabilities interact with the actions of the attackers. But what kind of metrics do we encounter in practice? To get a sense of this, we will go through four examples. The Cloud Security Alliance Control Matrix, a security service legal agreement, a software security maturity model, and the National Cyber Security Assessments for the Netherlands. Let's start with the metrics defined by the Cloud Security Alliance. The CSA defines security principles to guide cloud vendors and assist cloud customers in assessing the overall security level of a cloud provider. The Cloud Controls Matrix is aligned with CSA's guidance in 16 security domains, including application security, identity and access management, mobile security, encryption and key management, and data center operations. To estimate this overall security level, more than 130 controls are measured. As the name already tells you, this whole metric is based on controls. In other words, it claims to give you a good understanding of the security level of a cloud service, but purely looking at controls. Some metrics mention vulnerabilities, but only in terms of the controls needed to deal with them. So, if we map the CSA matrix onto our framework, it is based exclusively on controls. It completely ignores the threat environment or any actual attack data. Next, we analyze security indicators used in service legal agreements. A security SLA is a legal contractual document that states the security level of the service offers to the customer. Let's take an email security SLA as an example. This SLA mainly states that the service will be available 24-7, that the amount of emails currently marked as spam will be almost zero. All emails will be virus-free and any incident will be taken care according to its severity. All these characteristics sound like security performance, but a closer look reveals that they are actually talking about the performance of the control itself, not the legal security, not the level of security it claims to achieve. For instance, 24-7 service just means that Trend Micro has deployed enough email servers to ensure the availability of the service. There is one intriguing exception to this. They promised that you will receive zero email-based virus infection. That does indicate an actual level of security. Until you take a closer look, what happens if you do get an email-based infection? Then, Trend Micro will give you a discount in the month's subscription fee. In other words, it's not a really guarantee of the level of security. It just means that if they fail, you will receive a bit of money. So, it explicitly acknowledges that this can happen, which pulls it more towards a vulnerability type of metric, I would say. If we map this particular SLA to our framework, we realize that the majority of the metrics are on the left-hand side. To a much lesser extent, it includes metrics on vulnerabilities and incidents. Another example of security metrics in practice is the so-called building security in maturity model. BSIM is an observational model built from real-world software security initiatives. It defines metrics based on 12 practices, with 110 activities. It claims these are associated with developing more secure software. 
Each activity includes an objective, action to take, and two or three examples based on actual practice. Activities include such familiar tasks as secure coding, the use of static analysis tools, assurance cases, and attack patterns. An organization then can rate itself on all these activities, resulting in scores for the different practices. By comparing itself with a group of peers, businesses can see areas where they are performing well or where they need to spend more effort. A spider graph can visualize this. As you can see, the blue firm is outperforming the other firms in domains like penetration testing and code review, but it's lagging in the area of the strategy and metrics. If we map BSIM onto our framework, we can see that these metrics are also leaning towards the left-hand side. Most of the metrics are about controls, like secure coding. It also mentions some vulnerabilities and activities like penetration testing, but it does not seem to measure the rate of severity of vulnerabilities. Rather, it checks whether these activities are in place, which threats them more like controls. You can see the difference with metrics that are more explicitly focused on vulnerabilities, like the Common Vulnerability Score System, or CVSS. As final example, let's take a look at the cybersecurity assessment in the Netherlands. It provides an overview and ranking of the threats facing this country. At the core of the extensive report is a table that gives insight into the severity of the threats that certain actors pose to governments, private organizations, and citizens. It also compares these to previous years, indicating whether a threat has gone up or down. Each threat is assigned a weight of low, moderate, or high. Its level is defined by a mix of some data on reported or emerging incidents, a lot of information about discovered vulnerabilities, and a fair bit about the existing controls. The report aims to be forward-looking, which is why it spends a lot of time on emerging vulnerabilities. Even the incidents are mostly viewed as potential vulnerabilities for others, not so much as metrics in their own right. In other words, the assessment is predominantly a qualitative evaluation of the existing controls in light of emerging vulnerabilities. Again, mapped onto the framework, we can say that this assessment focuses mainly on vulnerabilities, a bit on controls, and a little on incidents. To conclude, we have seen that the examples focus mostly on controls, especially when they have been developed by security industry or service providers. Why is that? It's about insectives. Controls are easier to measure. They are deterministic in nature. Selling controls, security solutions, is their business model. So they don't have proper incentives to take the threat environment into account. On the other hand, controls are about the fort, not about results against attackers, and focusing on controls leaves the risk of failure with the buyer. Thank you.